Hi guys, we're here for our Bible in a Year challenge reading. We are on May 19th today, and that is going to come from 1 Kings 3 through 4, Psalm 64, and Acts 27. Okay, so 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon asks for wisdom. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and married one of his daughters. He brought her to live in the city of David until he could finish building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around the city. At that time, the people of Israel sacrificed their offerings at local altars, for a temple honoring the name of the Lord had not yet been built. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the instructions of his father David, except that Solomon too offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local altars. The most important of these altars was at Gibeon, so the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and God said, What do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, You were wonderfully kind to my father David because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued this great kindness to him today by giving him a son to succeed him. O Lord my God, now you have made me a king instead of my father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am among your own chosen people, a nation so great they are too numerous to count. Give me an understanding mind so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great nation of yours? The Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply and was glad that he had asked for wisdom. So God replied, Because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people and have not asked for a long life or riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind such as no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and honor. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant, where he, asked burnt, where he sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. Then he invited all his officials to a great banquet. Solomon judges wisely. Some time later, two prostitutes came to the king to have an argument settled. Please, my lord, one of them begged, this woman and I live in the same house. I gave birth to a baby while she was with me in the house. Three days later, she also had a baby. We were alone. There were only two of us in the house. But her baby died during the night when she rolled over on it. Then she got up in the night and took my son from beside me while I was asleep. She laid her dead child in my arms and took mine to sleep beside her. And in the morning when I tried to nurse my son, he was dead. But when I looked more closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't my son at all. And the other woman interrupted. It certainly was your son. The living child is mine. No, the first woman said. The dead one is yours and the living one is mine. And so they argued back and forth before the king. Then the king said, let's get the facts straight. Both of you claim the living child is yours. And each says that the dead child belongs to the other. All right, bring me a sword. So a sword was brought to the king. Then he said, cut the living child in two and give half to each of these women. Then the, women, the woman who really was the mother of the living child and who loved him very much cried out, Oh no, my lord, give her the child. Please don't kill him. But the other woman said, All right, he will be neither yours nor mine. Divide him between us. Then the king said, Do not kill him, but give the baby to the woman who wants him to live, for she is his mother. Word of the king's decision spread quickly throughout all Israel, and the people were awed as they realized the great wisdom God had given him to render decisions with justice. Okay, chapter 4, Solomon's officials and governors. So Solomon was king over all Israel, and these were his high officials. Az Azariah, son of Zadok, was the priest. Elihoreph and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, were court secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilad, was the royal historian. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was commander of the army. Zadok and Abithar were the priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, presided over the district governors. Zabad, son of Nathan, a priest, was a trusted advisor to the king. Ahishar was manager of palace affairs. Adoniram, son of Abda, was in charge of the labor force. Solomon also had 12 district governors who were over all Israel. They were responsible for, for providing food from the people for the king's household. Each of them arranged provisions for one month of the year. These were the names of the 12 governors. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim. ben Deker in Maz Makaz. 
Shalbid, Beth Shemesh and Elan Beth Hanan, Ben Hesed in Aruboth, including Soko and all the land of Hefer, Ben Abinadab in Naphath Dor. He was married to Taphath, one of Solomon's daughters. Bana, son of Ahilad in Tanich and Megiddo, all of Beth Shan near Zareth and below Jezreel, and all the territory from Beth Shan to Abel, Mehola, and over to Jachmim. Ben Geber in Ramath Gilead, including the towns of Jer, named for Jer, son of Manasseh, in Gilead, and in the Argob region of Bashan, including 60 great fortified cities with gates barred with bronze. Ahinadab, son of Ido in Mahanaim. Ahimaz in Naphtali, he was married to Basemath, another of Solomon's daughters. Bana, son of Hushai in Asher and in Aleth. Jehoshaphat, son of Parua in Issachar. Shimei, son of Ella in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri in the land of Gilead, including the territories of King Sihon of the Amorites and King Og of Bashan. And there was one governor of the land of Judah. Solomon's prosperity and wisdom. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They were very contented with plenty to eat and drink. Seeing Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines as far south as the border of Egypt. The conquered peoples of those lands sent tribute money to Solomon and continued to serve him throughout his lifetime. The daily food requirements for Solomon's palace were 150 bushels of choice flour and 300 bushels of meal. 10 oxen from the fattening pens, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep or goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. Solomon's dominion extended over all the kingdoms west of the Euphrates River from Hifsa to Gaza, and there was peace throughout the entire land. Throughout the lifetime of Solomon, all of Judah and Israel lived in peace and safety. And from Dan to Beersheba, each family had its own home and garden. Solomon had 4,000 stalls for his chariot horses and 12,000 horses. The district governors faithfully provided food for King Solomon and his court each during his assigned month. They also brought the necessary barley and straw for all the royal horses in the stables. God gave Solomon great wisdom and understanding and knowledge too vast to be measured. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the East and the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite and Heman, Kalkal, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. His fame spread throughout all the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants, from great cedar of Lebanon to the tiny hyssop that grows from cracks in a wall. He could also speak about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, and kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. Okay, Psalm 64. For the choir director, a Psalm of David. O oh God, listen to my complaint. Do not let my enemies' threats overwhelm me. Protect me from the plots of the wicked, from the scheming of those who do evil. Sharp tongues are the swords they wield. Bitter words are the arrows they aim. They shoot from ambush at the innocent, attacking suddenly and fearlessly. They encourage each other to do evil and plan how to set their traps. Who will ever notice, they ask. As they plot their crimes, they say, We have devised the perfect plan. Yes, the human heart and mind are cunning. But God himself will shoot them down. Suddenly his arrows will pierce them. Their own words will be turned against them, destroying them. All who see it happening will shake their heads in scorn. Then everyone will stand in awe, proclaiming the mighty acts of God, realizing all the amazing things he does. The godly will rejoice in him and find shelter in him, and those who do what is right will praise him. Okay, and Acts 27. Okay, Paul sails for Rome. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of an army officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. And Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a boat whose home port was... Adramitium. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province of Asia. The next day when we docked at Sidon, Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit his friends so they could provide for his needs. 
Putting out to sea from there, we encountered headwinds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course, so we sailed north of Cyprus between the island and the mainland. We passed along the coast of the provinces of Sicilia and Pamphylia, landing at Myra in the province of Lycia. Lycia? There the officer found an Egyptian ship from Alexandria that was bound for Italy, and he put us on board. We had several days of rough sailing, and after great difficulty, we finally neared Snidus. But the, great, but the wind was against us, so we sailed down to the leeward side of Crete, past the Cape of Salmo. We struggled along the coast with great difficulty, and finally arrived at Fair Havens, near the city of Lassia. We had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for long voyages by then because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Sirs, he said, I believe there is trouble ahead if we go on shipwreck, loss of cargo, injuries, and danger of our lives. But the officers in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul. And since Fairhaven was an exposed harbor, a poor place to spend the winter, most of the crew wanted to go to Phoenix, farther up the coast of Crete, and spend the winter there. Phoenix was a good harbor with only a southwest and northwest exposure. The storm at sea. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors thought they could make it, so they pulled up anchor and sailed along close to the shore. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind, a wind of typhoon strength, a northeastern, they called it, caught the ship and blew it out to sea. They couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. We sailed behind a small island named Kata, where with great difficulty we hoisted aboard the lifeboat that was being towed behind us. Then we abandoned then we abandoned the ship with ropes to strengthen the hull. The sailors were afraid of being driven across the sandbars of Syrtis off the African coast, so they lowered the sea anchor and were thus driven before the wind. The next day, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing the cargo overboard. The following day, they even threw out the ship's equipment and anything else they could lay their hands on. The terrible storm raged unabated for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together and said, Men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left their havens. You would have avoid, avoided all this injury and loss, but take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of God's to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me, and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. The Shipwreck About midnight on the fourteenth night of the storm, wow, as we were being driven across the Sea of Adria, the sailor's sense land was near. They took soundings and found the water was only 120 feet deep. A little later, they sounded again and found only 90 feet. At this rate, they were <coughs> afraid we would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore. <coughs> so they threw out four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Then the sailors tried to abandon the ship. They lowered the lifeboat as though they were going to put out anchors from the prow. But Paul said to the commanding officer and the soldiers, You will all die unless the sailors stay aboard. So the soldiers cut the ropes and let the boat fall off. As the darkness gave way to the early morning light, Paul begged everyone to eat. You haven't touched food for two weeks, he said. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair of your heads will perish. Then he, gave, then he took some bread, gave thanks to God before them all, and broke off a piece and ate it. Then everyone was encouraged, and all 276 of us began eating, for that is the number we had aboard. After eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. When morning dawned, they didn't recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and wondered if they could get between the rocks and get the ship safely to shore. So they cut off the anchors and left them in the sea. Then they lowered the rudders, raised the foresail, and headed towards shore. But the, hit, but the ship hit a shoal and ran aground. The bow of the ship st stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and began to break apart. The soldiers wanted to kill the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. But the commanding officers wanted to spare Paul, so he didn't let them carry out their plan. Then he ordered all who could swim to jump overboard first and make for land. And he told the others to try for it on planks and debris from the broken ship. So everyone escaped safely ashore. That's all for today's reading. Thank you for joining me. We will see you next time.